Welcome to today our Three Angels Messages series. We learned last week that the Three Angels Messages, it's a global message, it's a message that goes to the whole world, every tribe, every nation, everybody should know about this. And we learned that the message of the Three Angels Messages, that at least the very, very first message, it's about God as our Creator, and that the hour of His judgment has what? Has come. Yeah, you guys there with me? I need, I'm going to need your participation here today, okay? So we know that the hour of this judgment has come. But we also learned last week that the, one of the messages of the first angel, it reminds us to keep the Sabbath day holy, which is Saturday, which has been long forgotten for many, many people. And God calls us to still worship Him on His holy day, to keep the Sabbath day holy. And as we go through the series, you will hear a little bit more about this. But we also learned last week that because God made you and I in His image, like Kathy and, and Randy and all of us in His image, that means that every human being, every, every single one of you has a value to God. Jesus would have come and died even if it was only for you alone. Can you imagine that love? The God of the universe? So, but today we will study about the second angel and its message. As, as you already saw on the screen, the message today is titled, The Second Angel, Babylon Has Fallen. Now, before we go here, uh, I have a couple of disclaimers. The very first one, maybe today is your first time here in this church. Maybe today is your first time in a Seventh-day Adventist church, period. And I want you to know this, just, just bear with me through the end. Because I'm going to share a few things here today that may shake the foundations of everything you ever believed. And I mean it, okay? But please, bear with me. Maybe you don't know me, but bear with me. I hope at the end of the message, at least you understand where we're coming from. At least you will know what the second angel is talking about, right? And, and, and the other thing I also want to mention is this, is that my intention is not to hurt, offend anyone, criticize any faith, religion, person, or lifestyle. No, 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 none of that. But we need to expose and speak about what the second angel says. Because you will understand today when the second angel says in Revelation, Babylon has fallen, the second angel is exposing the errors. The second angel is exposing the deceits that are out there in the world. And this is exactly how, what we are going to do here today. So again, this is a series, a three-part series. Today is the second part for a reason. There are a lot of things that I will mention here today that you might wonder, well, but I can't quite connect that very well yet. So for you to fully understand the three angels message and the whole message, you need to come back next week. So I'm going to keep you a little bit curious here today in some parts, but we need to make plans to be here next week to understand everything fully, okay? So, so how are we going to do this here today? Our task ahead is very, very simple. The first task, we will try to identify what? Well, are you guys there? We will identify what? Babylon. Our second task will identify the what? The religious deception. And our third task is identify the what? The moral deception and the sea. So we will we'll be investigators here today. We will identify Babylon, the religious deception, and the moral deception. Without any further ado, let's just quick take a quick reading again in the text. The text says, the second message, another angel, a second followed saying what? Fallen, fallen is Babylon, the great. She who made all nations drink of the wine of the passion of what? Her sexual immorality. Okay, so the very first thing you need to understand here is this. Okay, so what or who is Babylon? This is obviously a symbolic language. So we need to identify what Babylon is. For us to do this, we have to go through a, a, a process. But the very first thing I want to know is this. Babylon is not new in the Bible. As a matter of fact, Babylon, do you know what Babylon means? It means confusion. Confusion. You know where the word ba babble comes? Babies say babble, right? The ba ba ba. The ba they don't understand what they're saying. So that's where the word comes from. Just Babylon in itself means what? Con confusion. In the very first time in the Bible you hear a reference to Babylon or confusion is in the Tower of Babel. I'm sure you have heard about the story, right? The com but you need to get the context, right? God had just destroyed the world with what? With a big, big flood. And God told the people, don't worry, chill, I will never destroy the world again with 
a flood with water. Never again. As soon as the humanity takes the time to gather around and, 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 and multiply, the very first thing that they do is try to build a tower so high and so high, if possible, will reach the heavens. Now, isn't that interesting? Don't you think they may be trying to build their own, uh, maybe, flood insurance? What, are you getting my point? Are you guys, so God told them, I'll never destroy the world again with what? With water, because the water took over and they what? They rose really high. As soon as mankind has a chance, they want to be that power so high that possibly will do what? Which the heavens. They're trying to build their own flood insurance. But you have to understand, from its inception, from its beginning, Babylon stands in as opposition to God's word. It, it stands as a rebellion against God. God told me to do that. Well, wait a minute, let me do this. Let me build my tower just in case God changes his mind. Hence, again, you need to get this point. Babylon stands always as a rebellion against God. Well, later on in the Bible, we know that Babylon comes up again. Now, not, not just a tower of Babel, but as a nation. A pagan nation, an enemy nation who comes, takes over Jerusalem, takes over the people of Israel, and takes them to Babylon as slaves. And we know the story of this nation. They were pagans. They worshipped different gods. They, some of them practiced uh, child sacrifice. They did terrible, terrible things as a nation. Yet, they were very, very wealthy. And once you have a lot of money, you know you have a lot of influence, right? Am I, am I wrong? Am I wrong? Money? Influence. We see that everywhere. Now, maybe you don't know this, but let me tell you now. How many of you guys have heard about a horoscope? How many of you guys heard of a horoscope? Now, there are those people that never leave the home without reading the horoscope. Right? I hope you're not one of them, but if you are, we're glad you're here. But what about astrologers? What about astrology? Not astronomy, but astrology. Right? You give meaning, interpretation to the stars. All of this were borrowed from the Babylonians. Ah, some of you didn't know this. Now, can, do you know that every single part, all of us are influenced by them? Do you know how? How many minutes are there in one hour? 60. How many seconds are there in one minute? How many degrees are there in one circle? 360 in a circle, right? So all of this have been borrowed by the Babylonians. They use the 60 mathematical bases. So every single person sitting here today, if you're looking to your watch, you're still already hungry, so okay, well, how long is Pastor going to talk for? Well, let me tell you this, you're borrowing some Babylonian tradition. But, but of course, we have to ask ourselves, did this Babylonian empire, are they still running the world today? Are they? The Babylonian empire, hear me out. The Babylonian empire, are they still running the world today? No. The Babylonian empire fell in, in 539 before Christ. That was like 2600 years ago when the Persian army came in, Cyrus, and defeated the Babylonian empire. And the Babylonian empire as a nation, they no longer existed. So, hear me out, you need to pay attention to this. So, when we come to the book of Revelation, which was not written 2,600 years ago, it was written about 2,000 years ago, when we see John mentioning about Babylon has fallen, we have to ask ourselves, mm, is he talking about the Babylon that fell 600 years ago, or is he speaking about another Babylon that was still to come? This is very important for us to understand. So as we go now, we need to identify Babylon. And I like saying this, that the Babylon that we have to look for is a spiritual what? It's because the actual original Babylon is what? It's gone. They're no longer here. Okay, so we're looking to quickly into a clues to help us identify Babylon. Pay attention. This is in your study guide and you need to follow it because if you don't know the clues, you can never pinpoint the real identity of Babylon. So let's do this. So the very first clue we have, we have to ask ourselves, who was Peter referring to? Well, Peter, in one of his letters, in the end of his letters, he mentions Babylon. So look what he says here. By Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have what? Written briefly to you, uh, exhorting and declaring this, uh, this is the true grace of God. And he says, and he says what? He stand for me what? In it. And then what he says next? She who is where? At Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you what? Greetings and also does mark 
my son. Now again, Peter did not exist 26, 2600 years ago. Peter lived about 2000 years ago. So is Peter talking about the original Babylon that was destroyed? No. So we have to understand this. Peter is calling another city, another place. He's using the name Babylon to refer to another place that was existed in his time. So the question that we have, who was Peter referring to? The good news is that we have well documented in, in theology and in Christian history that the term Babylon in the first century was used to speak about one main city of the empire. Guess what city that was? The city of Rome. Absolutely, it was the city of Rome. And, and, and we have to understand this. So Peter was referring to the city of Rome. So this Babylon power that will come in the last days, it has to come, it has to be directly related to where? To the city of Rome. But Pastor, I mean, why are you saying this? Why, why, why would they call ba Rome Babylon? Well, Babylon was a pagan nation. Babylon did, uh, Rome was a pagan nation, they worshipped different gods, they, some of them sacrificed children, but they also partook in sexual orgies. So, there were a lot of similarities among the nations, but it was very easy for them to call that place what? A Babylon. Even to this day, even to this day, there are cities which you call them what? Babylon. How many of you have heard people calling Las Vegas Babylon? Right? I have heard that, it's very easy. So, do you get the point? So, a bad city was called what? Babylon, because Babylon stood in opposition. So, the first reference, the first clue that this power, it must come from, from Rome. It has to be directly related to Rome. Clue number two, Revelation 14, points to a tiny A of the what? Of the end. It's not only the times of Jesus, it points to the time of the end. So, in which even the Roman Empire was no longer existent. So when Peter is so, and now when John is referring about Babylon in the time of the end, something in the future, he could not only be talking about the city of Rome. Are you following me? Are you following me? So Babylon in Revelation 14 cannot only be a reference to the city of Rome, although it's related. Clue number three, Babylon, you gotta get this again. Babylon does not mean only represent a, a man's independence from God. Babylon represents what? God's, uh, man's what? Rebellion against God. It's not that I'm independent now, I no longer need you. It's that I'm totally against what you stand for. And that's what Babylon it stands for. Clue number four, and again, Today we don't have the time to cover this, but next week you'll get a whole lot more of this. Next week we will tell you, uh, identify, will help you to find for yourself what the beast is and even what the mark of the beast is in the last days. So you'll not be here for next week. If you don't know what it is, if you're confused, if you think it's a little chip or www, you will not be here next week. But for now, the point I want to make is this, that according to the is the beast of Revelation 13, the, uh, the, the Babylon of Revelation 14, the Roman city, we're going to talk about this woman today in Revelation 17, and the Babylon in Revelation 18, all of this refers to the same, to the same system. But they speak in different ways. Kind of you having a picture, you, you have one person, you have four different, uh, four different artists to paint the same picture. They're all going to paint what? Differently, but it's still the same one person. So that's what they're doing. They're speaking a little bit differently, but about the very same thing. But when we read those texts, we can clearly see that Babylon is what? It's a religious and a what? A political system of the last days, especially in the last days. Clue number five, that's a very interesting one here, uh, clue number five. Look what Revelation 14 8 says. says, again, then another angel, a second followed, saying what? Follow, follow is Babylon the great. She who made what? All nations drink of the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Now, I want to ask you a question here. It's a rhetorical question. You don't need to raise your hand, okay? How many of you have ever been drunk? Don't, don't raise your hand. Please don't raise your hand. Right? Think about it. Let me ask you this. When you were drunk, would you say that when you were drunk, you made the best decisions of your life? Well, now, I never met anybody who says, I, Pastor, I made the best decision I ever made when I was drunk. I never met that. 
Never met that. And I hope I'll never meet somebody like this. If your position when you were drunk or bad, imagine when, when you were not drunk or bad, imagine when you were drunk. Now, but here's the point. What do you think is easier for you to be deceived? When you were drunk or when you were sober? Huh? When you were drunk. That happens in nightclubs sometimes when some really bad guys want to put you to sleep. They put something in your little drink and you take that drink and suddenly you are totally groggy and you fall asleep and rapes have been done by this. The point of this, when you are drunk, you cannot what? Think properly. Your mind, your mind is clouded and, and Babylon deceives the whole world like wine. Wine may look tasty at first, appealing by the color, but Proverbs says that once you start drinking it, it's like a serpent. Its venom will go within you and you will not think it straight. So point number five is this, this, this system, this power, confuses and deceives the whole world like what? Like the wine. Meaning that people are not thinking clearly nowadays. They are not. Clue number six. Babylon is what? Sexually immoral. Now, since everything here is symbolic language, because you know there are no angels flying the skies, there are no dragons with seven heads flying the skies, all of this is symbolic language. When the Bible mentions about sexual immorality in a symbolic language, it's speaking about what is spiritual what? Adultery. So, let's make it simple. If you cheat on your spouse, you call that what? Adultery. If you worship other God, you call that idol. Latry, okay? So the Bible also often talks about a spiritual adultery with the language of adultery. Idolatry speaks in the language of adultery. So when the Bible is saying that Babylon uh, uh, have made the whole world drink from the wine of her sexual immorality, means that Babylon is this political, this religious system that has borrowed a lot from what? From pagan practices. Are you guys there of pagan origins? You see? So Babylon needs to borrow from pagan practices and pagan origins. Are you following me? Are you following me? Now let's go to the last two clues, clue number seven and clue number eight. Clue number seven, before we read the text, I'll tell you, Babylon is not alone. Babylon has daughters. Daughters. We will read that right now. And clue number eight is that what? Babylon persecuted the saints and killed them for 1,000 260 years. Today I cannot mention about the timing to you, but it, next week if you come up, I will explain exactly why we know that Babylon persecuted, tortured, and killed saints, the godly people, for 1,260 years. So let's let's just read the text here. Revelation 17. Now the woman sitting on the beast. Look what it says. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of what? abominations and impurities of her sexual immorality. You see the language here? You see how similar it is to Babylon, right? Oh, but this is not Babylon. Right? Look what it says. And on her what? Forehead was written a name of what? Mystery. So what was written on her forehead? What? Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and earth's abomination. And I saw the woman drunk with the what? The blood of the whom? The saints. The blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't forward the, the, the text here. But like what? So you see, she, she, she is the mother of her prostitutes and earth's abominations, and she also, she is drunk with the blood of the saints. So right here we see, if she's a mother, she's, she has what? She has daughters, she has children, right there. And also she persecuted and killed, because if she is drunk with the blood of the saints, can you imagine how many, how much blood she must have spilled? But how many innocent people, innocent children were killed, tortured, families were destroyed, torn apart because this power, this religious and political power, wanted nothing but power and influence in the world. Very, very sad. But this is what Babylon has done. Now, okay. So let's just summarize here again, uh, looking to her eight clues. Let's let's summarize them again. The first one it comes from. Rome. Second is that it arises after the pagan Rome was already what? Uh, ex Non-existent. Third one is Babylon is always what? Rebelling against God. Fourth one, it is a global, religious and what? Political power. Fifth one is, is what? It deceives the whole, the whole world. Sixth one is that it borrows its practice from where? 
paganism means that it, that it practices what? Idolatry. The seven, uh, the seven things that Babylon is what? The mother church, the mother system of faiths and beliefs and abominations. And the last clue that we have, they killed, persecuted the saints for 1,260 years. So the question that we have in who or what is Babylon then? So again, I told you that I might share here something with you today that might be earth shattering. It may, it may really shatter your beliefs. You may have never heard this before. But first of all, know that I love you. Right? I'm Pastor Diego. I'm your friend. I'm right here. My goal is not to offend anyone, not to hurt anyone. And next, if you're not convinced about the eight clues, because what we're trying to see here is that one power that will fit all of them. Not one, not two, not three, not seven. It has to fit every single one of them. Okay? To be precisely accurate, our identification. Again, I'm not here to offend anyone or any religion or any faith, but when we put all this data together and we ask you what is represented by Babylon in the Bible, there is no shadow of doubt in my mind. The only possible answer is that Babylon is the Church of Rome, the Roman Catholic Church and system, and any, now listen to me, this is, and any set of false teachings and beliefs that deceive the world today. Amen. Are you hearing me this? Yeah. People think, oh, it's just about uh, the Roman Catholic Church. No, 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 it's any system of beliefs. Yeah. But the mother comes from the city of Rome, from the throne of Rome. And again, if this is my be earth shattering to you, come back next week because you'll be amazed how much evidence the Bible piles up to, to show this. Now, Pastor, so uh, are you saying then that you know, we should be careful with Catholics and whatever? No, 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 no. My father is a Catholic. All right, I was raised going to the Catholic Church as a little child. This is not about people that go to church. It's not about your grandpa, your grandma, your mother, or even yourself. This is about the political and the religious system who killed, tortured people for 1,260 years through the indulgences and the dark ages. And it still has great influence in the world today. Come next week to find out that in more details. Faster, okay. Maybe listen, this is the very first time here. So, are you saying then that the Roman Catholic Church and the system, the whole system, borrow their practices from paganism? Are you kidding me? They're the oldest church ever. How would they ever do that? That's exactly what I'm telling you. And that's the next part of the message now. The second angel, my friends, exposes deceit, exposes deception and error. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we are called to speak of love, respect of one, but we gotta call sin by its right name. We have to speak the truth and love the truth and know that God is gonna reveal to their hearts what must be revealed. But this is the message of the second angel. So, we will now identify the three main deceits, listen, the three main religious deceptions that are out there in the world today. Again, I told you, this may be earth shattering, but I need you to bear with me, okay? Alright, you there still? So, the very first one that I want to show you about the religious deceit is about the immortality of the soul. I mean, what are you talking about? Well, the immortality of the soul is the original life. The very first life. Remember in the garden, God told Adam and Eve, the day that the day that you eat from this tree, you surely will die. And what did Satan do? He will not die. You will be like what? You will be like God. Friends, almost every single religion in the world today, with, without without questions, believe that we are passing here somehow, but we have souls within our bodies that will continue to live on some shape or form. We even watch this in the movies, almost like every single movie, especially from Disney, that we watch, they have an ancestor, a spirit, a ghost who talks, and somebody who died, and our kids watch television, they are afraid of the dark, they are afraid of ghosts, if you are afraid of going to a graveyard, all of this, there is no sense to be afraid of any of that. That is the good news. Now, let me show you what the Bible actually speaks about of those who are dead, those who are no longer among us. Ecclesiastes, and again, there are too many texts about this, but because of time I don't have, I'm only going to share a few. Ecclesiastes 9, 5, 6. Look what the Word of God actually says about those who are no longer among us. 
So the living know they will what? But so they don't know what? Nothing. They don't know what? Nothing. And they have no more reward for the memory of them what? It's for God. They don't know about anything. Their love and their hate and their envy have already watched. Perished. So they're not angry. They're not happy. They're not uh, begrudges. No of what is happening. And forever they have no more share in all that is done under the watch. That's sin. So let me break this down here. What, what, what does this mean? This means this. That my beloved grandmother, which I love so much, she's not in heaven right now. She's neither in hell. She's not in purgatory. No, she's not. My grandmother right now, she is unconscious. Amen. Because she can't think. She can't see my joy. She can't see my down moments. She can't see anything because she does not know. The Bible compares death to a sleep. Now, how aware are you when you're asleep? <laughs> not really. Not much, right? But wait a minute. Are you saying, Pastor, there's no hope? What, what are you talking about? So they're gone or gone? What's the point of being here if you're just going to end up in the grave? The Bible has a powerful promise. Look what the Bible has, friends. This is amazing. I love this poem. First Thessalonians. And, and, and I want you to read this here with me because this is powerful. This is Paul talking to his church. And, and people are getting discouraged. People were dying out. People were dying. Oh, I'm never going to see them again. And death is painful. I know. I know you've lost people that you love. It's terrible. It's some people take years to overcome that because we are not meant to die. But look what it says here, First Thessalonians. But we do not want you to be what? Uninformed, brothers, about those who what? Those what? Asleep. That you may not grieve as others who have no hope. So for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him what? Those who have what? Fallen asleep. Even the apostle of Jesus said, for, for this we declare to you by the word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of whom? Of, coming of whom? This is speaking about the second coming of Jesus. Look what it says here. Will not precede those who have what? Why is he talking about death? He's comparing to a sleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of a trumpet, and what? And read together. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Amen. So, my beloved grandmother, your beloved friend, father, daughter, son, grandparents, mother, they will be able to be resurrected when Jesus comes. And it will be a total reunion. Total reunion at the same time. And look what Paul says is, look at what Paul says, for we who are alive, who are, um, I think, I know that, for we who are, alive, who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air, and so will always be with the Lord. Therefore, do what? Encourage one another with these words. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is the hope that the Bible says. But you hear this all the time. I died and I went to heaven. I came back to tell the story. This is usually good to make movies and, 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 and sell a lot of books to make millions of bucks. But this is not biblically true. The Bible does not speak about anyone dying immediately going to heaven, coming back to tell the story how he actually went, how things actually happened. But it's not. When we die, we no longer suffer. We no longer have pain. We rest, asleep, until the day the Lord Jesus will come back in the clouds of heaven to take us home. Amen? Amen. So, friends, Pastor, but, uh, what are you talking about here? So, are you saying that, this, that, that the Roman Catholic Church borrowed this idea from paganism? Yes! That's precisely, this is Greek philosophy, Greek mythology, but primarily philosophy with Plato and all of them. This is where this idea that the dead are living in heaven or hell or haunting us around and, and, and going around and, and hindering our lives. This was born from paganism. And since a lot of Greeks have become Christians, they start bringing their traditions, their beliefs, and merging with the church. And the truth became stained. That's what happened. But that's not in the Bible. Now let's go into our second religious deceit and deception in the world. Sunday is a day of worship. Well, you know, I'm sure you're here today. If you're here today for the very first time, you might be wondering, what's up with them? Why do they even go to church on Saturday? I mean, this is weird. A lot of friends that I know, that they said, what, what, you go to church on Saturdays? Why is that? Why do you guys do that? 
people usually don't know, but this has probably been the largest deceit in the whole world. People usually think that the day good to go to church is Sunday, but actually it's not. Now, let me tell you this. Is it wrong to worship God on Sundays? Is it wrong? No, of course not. You can worship God what? Any day you want. Any day. Praise the Lord. Amen? But the day that the Lord set aside for us to rest and worship Him and not do any work that is not related to life and God is Saturday. How do I know this? Well, there are several verses. I can't show you them all, but I'm going to show you in two parts. In the Old Testament, New Testament. Again, the Ten Commandments. Remember that? Sabbath day to keep it what? Holy. Six days you shall do what? Shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the what? Sabbath, the Lord of God. On it you what? So it's not like on my seventh day. It's the seventh day of the Lord your God. And that day is Sabbath. And it continues says, for what? In six days the Lord made heaven and the earth and all that is in them. And they on the rested on them. Seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and what? Made it holy. Ah, but this is only the Old Testament stuff. Now, why don't you show me something in the New Testament that talks about the Sabbath? There we go. Jesus, you know Jesus? Maybe I know Jesus, right? I know Jesus, the Son of God. Look what he says. No. And he said to them, the Son of Man is what? The Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus Christ himself had authority over the Sabbath. That's I am the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man so you and I could rest, take a break, not the other way around. So friends, many people have been deceived by this. And next week, I'm going to show you exactly how this change took place. But it was a Roman emperor who wanted to worship the sun and he changed the day of worship from Sabbath, which now calendar is we call Saturday, to Sunday. He wanted to worship the sun god and he changed it to the day of the sun. Now I wonder why they ever call it sun day? It's because the day they used to worship the sun. And this change took place first of a Roman emperor and later on it was Sanction, he was approved, encouraged by the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I, this is not conspiracy theory. They're very open about it. Just go and Google it. Next, I'm going to show you their statements. And the Roman Catholic Church, they, they, they're very open about it. They say, you know, our mark, our seal of authority is Sunday worship. That's what they say. You will see you next week. So I'm not here backstab anyone or say, they're very open about it. The thing is that they believe that the church is above the Bible. That's their theology. The church, the group of cardinals and the bishops are above the Bible. And they tell, well, the, the Bible is a guide, kind of a guide, but it's not really the main guide. The church is the main guide. The papacy, seat on the throne, is the main guide for truth, not the Bible. Seventh-day Adventist church, the Adventists don't believe that. We believe that what? The Bible is our main guide. So again, it is a very simple choice. It's not about studying any religion, any faith. It's about a matter of choice. I'm just being honest with you. You want to believe the tradition of a church and then, fine. It's up to you. But we want to stand and we're going to have the Bible as our authority, supreme authority, not a group of men. As plain as it is, as simple. We believe that this has been inspired by God. Men are inspired, but are very, very fallible. All right? So again, but uh, and, the, and the last deceit I want to mention, the religious deceit here, is about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Some people think that Jesus will come as a secret. Some people say, he'll come, he's already here, he's incarnated in someone, or he came down in Texas, or, or he's going to come, and only the saved, only those who love Jesus, will be able to see Jesus. The lost will not be able to see Jesus. Look what the Word of God says, Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he's coming what? The clouds. Who is coming in the clouds? Jesus is coming in the clouds. He says what? And every what? I will see him. But there is more in Matthew. Then will appear. Appear means implies we are seeing in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will what? Mourn. And they will do what? They will what? They will what? 
will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Friends, the second coming of Jesus, this image that you have here, the image you want to have right there now for you, it's not like a secret, it's not something that's going to come in, you know, from the back door, it's a secret like he came 2,000 years ago. The next time the Lord comes, he will come with the archangels, with all the angels in heaven, and he will be able to hear it, he will be able to see it, and by the way, the dead in Christ will rise first, amen? So don't be deceived by schemes or, or preachers out there that are saying that they have seen the Christ and the Christ is already back, but it's not. Now, I'm telling you now, I told you this is going to be difficult to digest. I'm going to, now, I'm going to touch now a very, very, very delicate point of our culture. Okay, I'm warning you. This is not for the faint of heart. Right? I want to touch a very important topic because Babylon does not simply deceive the world with its religion. There is moral deceit, deception out there. And I try to summarize them in, in, in two simple ones because of timing here. There's so much, there's so much we could talk about this here. But, but I try to summarize in two simple ones. The very first one is I feel, therefore I what? I am. What are you talking about, Pastor? Well, I'm sure you have heard from, from our media, uh, CNN, CMC, all those types of medias, they usually, they, they try to push an envelope, say, if you feel good, just do just do it. Is that how you feel it? Just do it. You feel this way, so that, that means where you are. I, I feel like this, so therefore I am. This is a dire and great deceit. Let me show you something here. Uh, have you heard about Stephanie Walsh? Stephanie Walsh. This is a 52-year-old male who had seven children and then after, when he was 52 years old, he decided that he was no longer a man. And then this is what he said, I can't deny I was what? A father, that I have children. But I moved on now. I went back being a six-year-old girl. <laughs> yeah. Go and Google it. This is serious stuff. Now, again, I believe this, this person here, this man, should not be crucified. We should love him and embrace him and help him to, to, to understand himself. But what drives me insane is that the media and a lot of groups of people applaud this. You know, some people actually call him a brave man as a hero. Now, the moment that our standards of, of, of heroism and, and our heroes become 52-year-old males who want to behave like little girls, there is something fundamentally wrong with you. With you. Fundamentally wrong. This year, with all the respect, is messed up. I will never let anyone like this, like this, near my child. Because this person needs support, needs help. But we can't encourage them in their, in their stupidity. This is serious. And we go and tell our children, everyone, yeah, if you feel you are. No, it's not. I could feel an American. I couldn't just get an American passport any time I wanted. <laughs> this is stupid. If I feel like a goat, would that make me a goat? <laughs> no. But what would you do? If I start behaving like a goat, I can tell you, I will lose a job in no minute. <laughs> right? But since we're on the topic, I mean, this year is called Transager. Not only transgender, this is transager. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, if, 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 even if I, I'm 33, by the way, I'm not 40, 50, but if I tell you I'm a six years old little boy, you're still going to think I have a mental problem. I'm not supposed to be encouraged, you know, applauded, put up on a pet as a symbol of, of, of courage and bravery. This is ridiculous. But since on the topic of ridiculous, this is a lady in Norway. She said when she was 16 years old, she realized I was a cat. Google it. No, 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 no. But Google it. It's right there. And again, of course, she receives some criticism, but there's still some people are like, I'm very good, you know. 
you feel before you are, you are who you want to be. Friends, this is insane. This lady needs help. Serious mental help. And the way they're doing now, they're trying to get the... the and, and, no, you cannot... You, no, no, no. This is okay now. You cannot call this a problem, a disease. This is okay. So even people who have licenses to help people like this, sometimes they have their hands tied up because the government says what they want. You can't tell now the people that are having problems with their sexuality, homosexual attraction, you say, no, you cannot help them, no, because no, this is normal. No, this is not normal. This is not normal. They still have to be embraced and loved. Some people think that the greatest, the greatest sin is says homosexuality. Well, in the church there is gossip, there is people smoking, drinking, some of you are falling down the, down the gutter, drinking, drunk. All of this is bad. But we have to be able to stand for the truth. How can you stand for the truth if you do not, not know what the truth is? Or you don't know what the truth stands for? People, homosexuals, transagers, transgenders, they must be embraced in our community and love. Yes, but we still need to tell that this practice, the practice is not acceptable. What is the difference between a man who feels attraction to other women but does not follow that because he wants to be faithful to his wife and a man who has attraction to other men but does not follow this because he wants to be faithful to God? There's no difference. If there's any man sitting here who, who could stand up and throw the stone throw me, but every single one of you has already left it in your mind. In your mind. Don't see that as a pious. I have. I'm a sinner. I have my wife who supports me, is always there with me. But you have to understand, just because you feel, that doesn't give you the entitlement to do it and to be it. Amen. It doesn't. Amen. But we have to understand this. We have to teach our kids, if we don't stand for the truth now, that is still okay. When things get really, really dark and gloomy, we will be hiding ourselves, and when the Lord Jesus comes, we'll ask the rocks to fall on our heads. But I don't want to be dead on that day like this. The second major moral deceit, which is similar, but is a stupid, a stupid sentence. Follow your heart. I know what is follow your heart. You watch it everywhere. Listen, listen to me. The greatest mistakes ever done on the face of the earth were made because people follow their hearts. Oh, you yes, know, you married, you have a, a wife and, and your kids, and now you look at this little girl in, in your office while she's hitting on you and say, you know, my wife, and you are, yeah, she's 55 years old, got this little one here, you know, I'm going to follow my heart. You have the divorce and run with this little chick. You destroy your family, your peace, because you're being stupid in following your heart. Oh, but I said in a movie. You see that everywhere. Follow your heart, listen. Follow your heart is diabolical. It is diabolical. Look what the Jeremiah said. This is the Bible. That's what I'm telling you. It's diabolical. The word of God says. The word of God says. And the heart is what? Deceitful above what? All things. And desperately what? Wicked. Who can understand it? Sick. Your heart is sick. My heart is sick. So when you have to choose between, shall I follow my heart? Will I, will I sleep with this girl before I, I, before I get married? Will I sleep with this? I love this young boy. He treats me so nicely. Let me follow my heart and sleep with him. And every two weeks later, you're down the gut and he's going after another girl. Every time you follow your heart without God, guiding your heart, you're going to break your face. So don't kill your heart at the expense, don't, don't break your face at the expense of following your heart. This is a serious matter. And this is more deception out there. You go to some public schools, it's okay. You know, you do kids, seven, eight year olds, and about no dirty, one another, same gender, and everything is fine. And they claim the name of love. Let's, this is love, this is love. This is not love. You love, you accept, you welcome, yes, but there is a line. The behavior is unacceptable, and the behavior must change, because if we do not change our behavior, our behaviors will end to destruction, will end to our personal demise. That's why God has His law for us. Friends, I, again, I told you that I will be sharing things here that will be a little bit hard to digest, and I knew that it will take a little longer in the message today, because I need it. 
to share this. But the three angels, remember, they are God's people in the last days. Seventh-day Adventists and other Christians, we must stand up together and speak the truth, even if we have them false. This, this problem that we have today in our churches is that we are preaching the truth as though it, it, it was a lie, and there are those who are preaching the lies as though it was true. We have to stand up for what is right, with love, resolute, even if we have not fall. The second angel calls us to stand up for God, to expose the deceits, and the good news is, you know what the good news about this is what? The Babylon has fallen. Babylon has already been fallen. So, friends, as hard as it gets, as how much heat we can get right now, we can stand resolute with no fear because we know that Babylon will fall, is falling, has been falling from the beginning. God will be victorious, but God is asking for His people in the last days to stand for what is right and to stand with God. This is a serious matter. Very, very serious. You know why? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close up now, but I want you to hear me out here. Listen to me very carefully. Some of us have left Babylon but Babylon has never left you. I'm going to say that again. Some of us have left Babylon. You left churches, system beliefs, and political, whatever that led you astray. You left that already. You might be sitting here, but Babylon has not left you yet. There are things in your life, in your mind, that you know they are messed up. You're afraid of them, but you still do not want to leave them behind. With this, let me tell a little story. Many, many, many years ago, there were two cities. These cities hated God. Everything God stood for. Everything, they want to do their own thing. They practiced orgies. They practiced homosexuality. Children sacrificed. They did terrible things. One day God looked down to that city and said, I'm going to have to destroy this city. I have to put an end to this evil. This is too messed up. Too many people are suffering in that city. And, and he sees one family there. He says, okay, I, I got to save the, at least this family because this family, you know, they are related to, to, to my friend Abraham here. So God sent angels to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sent him three angels there. And when the angels go there with the message, again, three angels, look no other why, they go, they go into the city and, and, and the message is very clear. God is about to destroy this pit. This thing's gonna, this thing's gonna go, go blow up in the air. You guys gotta get out of here. He goes to Lot and his family. And as the angels are there, the, the, the inhabitants of the city, they see those men coming in. Now they want to break into the house and they want to, to go and get these men and even rape them. See how messed up that city was. Now the angels decided to behave like angels. So they did the little thing, everybody got blind. And, and the angels told Lot again, Lot, you gotta get out of here right now. This city is gonna be dis destroyed. And the Bible says, Godfrey, they took a little longer. He spent a little extra time there, Caleb. And what happens then? That the angels have to come, grab them by their hands, and say, Let's get out of here. So when they're coming, they take them out of outside of the city, out of the gate, and said, Run, run for your lives, run to the mountains, and never look back. Don't, whatever happens, don't look back. This family starts running and running. They get, to, they get to the foot of the mountain and they can hear from the back the sound of fire. The fires begin falling from heaven and falling upon the city. They begin hearing the voices of people and remembering their lives and what life was like in that city. Yes, it was messed up, but yeah, we enjoyed it so much. We didn't want to leave that city. And, but the angel told them, don't ever look back. But the wife of Lot, she looked back. And the moment she looked back into that city, she looked back in everything that she left. She looked back while she wished she was still there. She looked back not because she just wanted to see what was happening. She looked back because her life, her heart was still in Sodom and Gomorrah. And she turned, the Bible says, into a statue of salt. Friend, the three angels are knocking at the door of our hearts today. And the angels are saying, yes, Come out of Babylon in Revelation 18. Come out of Babylon so you do not partake in hard destructions. But have you ever wondered what is three in the Old Testament and three angels in the New Testament? This world is about to go down real bad. Simple English here. We gotta be prepared. We gotta get out of Babylon. 
We have to abandon the deceits of Babylon, the deception. But we have to abandon also our immorality. And don't tell me that you don't know what I'm talking about because I know that we struggle with our morality. There are people sitting here who are addicted to pornography. There are some of you here who are still struggling with your own sexuality, with homosexuality. There are people here who struggle with gambling. You're still taking some sips at home, alcohol, you think nobody will ever notice that. You come to church, throw a hose in, you're smoking, you think nobody will notice this. Let me tell you this. This is your place. You can come smelling alcohol or cigarette no matter what. You can go, you can, you can, you can just have done terrible things at night and you come here, we we'll always will welcome you. But when you come to Jesus, Jesus will never leave you where you are. Amen. Keep your eyes on Jesus. I know you want to live and abandon this messiness of your life. But it's not only time to, to leave Babylon, it's time to have Babylon leave us. So I'm going to invite a praise team to come as we close you now. I'm going to sing our last song. We have this hope about the second coming of the Lord Jesus. We will stand up together and we'll sing together this song. We have this hope. And in the time of prayer, everybody will close their eyes but me. I'll have my eyes open. And if any of you would like to surrender your life to God and say, Lord, I know I've been deceived. I, maybe I've deceived even myself. But you want to get out of Babylon. And you want Babylon to get out of you. As I pray, you're going to raise your hand and God will see and God will bless you. Surrender today in the altar of God what is holding you back. Yes, you may have left Babylon, but now it's time for Babylon to leave you. God bless you.